The jungles of our world have long been at the center of many mysteries. Its vast expanse and hazardous undergrowth leaves many to wonder what exactly lies at the heart of that tangle of vines. Occasionally, discoveries are made that answer some of these questions, while others only leave us with even more uncertain puzzles. So today, here at Unexplained Mysteries, we'll be taking a look at three interesting jungle discoveries and mysteries. The Mystery of the Billy Apes Over a century ago, Belgian colonizers found a large primate skull during their rampage in the northern Congo. The locals would tell them stories of mysterious large apes that would attack and eat lions. Gorillas were never before found in this region of northern Congo, so researchers and explorers were confused and intrigued. They believed it to be an entirely new species of ape, although they never found any additional evidence or proof of life. The skull was promptly left to collect dust in the Royal Museum for Central Africa in Belgium until the 1990s, when Karl Amann read about them in a scientific article. He was a Swiss-born photographer and devoted conservationist. Enraptured by the skull's puzzle, he set off on an adventure through the dense jungles that few had traversed before. The Biliuli Tropical Forest covers 12,000 square miles and is a mix of impenetrable canopy and large stretches of savanna. The researchers had to trek through an impenetrable underbrush full of ants, mosquitoes and bees that were drawn to their sweat. Despite being such a difficult undertaking, a man ended up repeatedly visiting the forest over the span of 10 years, with various rangers, camera crew and primatologists trying to find the elusive Billy Apes. On his first trip, he found another ape skull, which only increased his obsession. In 2004, American primatologist Cleve Hicks joined the search. He spent weeks traversing through the forest, trying to find the apes. He and his team set up motion-detecting cameras and eventually captured images of the elusive billy apes. As it turns out, they were not a new species. They were chimpanzees. However, they were unlike any chimpanzees the researchers had seen before. They had larger skulls and feet than other chimpanzees. Their behavior was unique in that they nested on the ground like gorillas instead of in the canopy. They also used the longest tools researchers had seen in Africa to collect ants and honey. On one expedition, researchers came across a chimpanzee eating a leopard, although they did not know whether the chimp had attacked it or not. The locals called them lion destroyers and explained that even their poison darts would not affect the apes. Hicks stated that they were the largest population of wild chimpanzees anywhere in the world. He claimed that they were curious of the humans rather than fearful, which led him to believe that they had never seen humans before. Those that lived closer to civilization would flee when approached, but the apes further in would gather close to observe before quietly leaving. Since they lived in such remote parts of the jungle, it was near impossible for poachers or any other humans to encounter them. Today, though, the forest is a hiding spot for many fugitives or rebel groups and is being turned into farmland. The Disappearance of Bruno Manza On May 25, 2000, Swiss environmentalist Bruno Manza disappeared in the Borneo forests and has never been seen since. He was declared legally deceased five years later as there was no sign or evidence of him found. He was 45 at the time and had spent the past 10 years fighting the Malaysian government and logging companies on behalf of the Penan, the indigenous jungle nomads of Borneo. Manza wanted to live a life without consumerism, capitalism and technological advancements. As a young adult, he refused the Swiss military draft and served a few months in jail. He then moved to the Alps to work as a cow and sheep herder and learned how to make his own tools and food. He became enchanted with this type of simple living. Switzerland was not enough for him, so at 30 years old he travelled to Borneo. He soon learned about the Penan nomadic tribes and decided to try and find them and live with them. After searching the dense Sarawak jungle in Malaysia, 
he finally came in contact with them in May 1984. After some time, the Penan accepted his presence and he began to learn their language and culture. He grew out his hair into their traditional mullet, wore a loincloth, walked barefoot and even hunted with a blow dart. The Penan nicknamed him Lackey Penan, which means Penan Man. They respected him and considered him one of their own. The politics in Borneo grew more complicated and aggressive, as the government backed the logging companies who were destroying the forests and desecrating sacred lands. The deforestation contaminated their drinking water, significantly reduced the vegetation and game, and limited the tribe in their movements. Mansa began to work alongside the Penan in their attempts to thwart the loggers. Over the next decade, he would go back almost every year to visit the tribe, usually by illegally crossing the border out of Indonesia to get to them, and would assist them in their battle with the loggers. He travelled the world and held lectures, protests and strikes to garner attention to the Penan's plight. He set up a fund to give aid to the indigenous people in the forest, and the cause eventually gained notoriety around the world. Politicians and leaders around the world condemned the deforestation which angered the Malaysian government. They denied him entry and put a bounty on his head when he swam across the border at night. He was enemy number one of the state and escaped capture numerous times by using a fake passport and changing his appearance, running away while an officer was distracted and using the rivers and forest undergrowth to hide. In February of 2000, Mansa began his last trek to the Sarawak forest. He first travelled with the secretary of his fund, BMF, and a film crew. After a while, they left and he continued with a different friend for a few weeks until they arrived at the Sarawak-Kalimantan border. Mansa, aided by a local guide, crossed the border on the 22nd of May. The last known sighting of him was on May 25th when a local Penan and his son journeyed with him to the mountain Bukit Batu Lawi. Mansa intended to ascend the mountain alone. Searches and expeditions were conducted by Penan teams and members of the BMF, but to no avail. There were conspiracies that the Malaysian government ended his life, but those close to him believe he either fell down the mountain or took his own life. After his disappearance, he was awarded the International Society for Human Rights Prize and had a new species of goblin spider named after him. Ten years after his disappearance, a memorial service was held in Basel, Switzerland, to which 500 people attended. There have been films and books made about his story. Ho Vang Lan, the real-life Tarzan Ho Vang Lan was just a toddler when his father, Ho Van Than, took him into the forest in central Vietnam to live for the next 40 years. In 1972, Than was a soldier in the Vietnam War when a US bomb ended the life of his wife and two other sons in their home. He left behind the youngest son, Tri, and moved into the forest with Lang, where they completely isolated themselves from others. They taught themselves survival skills and fashioned tools out of the things they found in the jungle. They lived in a treehouse and grew their own produce to live off. Lang even wore a loincloth that he fashioned out of tree bark. Although Than chose to remove himself and his son from society, they were occasionally spotted by locals who reported it to the authorities. When Tri was 12 years old, he travelled with his uncle into the forest to look for his family. He eventually found them, but his father's mental health had severely declined, so that he did not recognize his youngest son and barely spoke. Lang, however, was eager to meet another person. Although his speech capabilities were limited since his father did not speak much, he was excited to meet his brother. Tri was unable to convince his father and brother to return to the village and integrate into modern society. They remained living in the forest and Tri returned once or twice a year to visit them and bring them rice and other supplies. In 2013, Lang left the forest for the first time at 41 years old. He and his father went back to the village after Tri convinced them, as their father's health was rapidly deteriorating. Lang learned to cope well with the change in lifestyle, but he still preferred the jungle. 
he learned how to take care of buffalo, to chop bamboo and rattan to sell, and found out that he had an allergy to beer. He struggled with the concept of money and was incredibly shy and nervous around women, as he had never seen one before. He spent most of his time walking into the fields to be close to the forest. Their father passed away in 2017. Lang grew tired of the village and wanted to be out in the field all day. It was almost a three-hour walk, so he would leave for the fields early in the morning and only come back late at night. He eventually stopped coming back as often and built a hut nearby in the forest. He now grows corn and banana, which he sells to the villagers along with any small game he catches. Lang returns a few nights a month to stay with his brother but prefers the simplicity and comfortability of the jungle. But what do you make of these jungle discoveries and mysteries? Be sure to let us know your thoughts in the comment section below and help us by growing this community while working to solve these unexplained mysteries. Thank you for watching and don't forget to subscribe for more videos.